Amen. Well, glad you're here. Good morning. We're going to continue through the book of Exodus and our series entitled Into the Wilderness. So if you have your Bible, which I hope you do, open to Exodus chapter 2. If you need a Bible, you're here for the first time, there should be some in the seat back in front of you or close by. As you guys are turning there, you know, it's been over four months since Hamas brutally attacked and invaded the state of Israel, killing over 1,200 innocent Israelis and taking hundreds of hostages. Many of you have been following the heartbreaking unfolding of these events and many different stories, praying for justice, praying for deliverance of those innocent hostages. And it's been happening. Weeks go by, more hostages are released, and the internet is full of their stories of how they've been delivered, what they had to go through, as well as their miraculous survival and liberation. One of these stories caught my attention was the testimony of a 36-year-old woman named Yarden Ramon God. Many of you are familiar with her because 60 Minutes did an interview. Did any of you see that piece on 60 Minutes about her where she shared her story on October 7th, which is a peaceful day, and the Hamas stormed her kibbutz and attacked her and her family. She was separated from her husband and her daughter, and she was taken captive for 54 days. And she talks about her time in captivity, how she just prayed for deliverance every day, and she hoped her family was safe. She didn't even know if they were still alive. And after two months, Israel negotiated for her deliverance through a ceasefire agreement, and she was rescued and given her freedom again. And the world watched as she was literally set free and embraced those who were safe and those who loved her. It's a great story of deliverance. There's many more hostages. Church, we need to pray for Israel and those hostages. But each week, the more I get delivered, it's a great story of deliverance. And we praise God and we celebrate what God is doing. So I was thinking about her story and her interview. I was thinking about our text this morning. We're going to be looking at a text that has to do with another great deliverance. And it's a deliverance that we're going to see unfold not only this morning, but the weeks and months to come. We're going to see this morning the Jews have been enslaved by a new king in Egypt. And the king is intimidated by them. And, and he wants to stop them from growing, even though he's fighting the promise of God, because promise, God promised that they would grow and multiply. So he's trying to stop that. He's afflicting them with hard labor. They're suffering, and they're crying out to God for deliverance. The good news is we have a God that hears prayers, amen? And where he's going to hear their prayers, and he's going to begin the process of raising up a deliverer to rescue them. And our text today is going to focus on that deliverer whose name was Moses. He's going to be born, and we're going to see in our text how God is sovereignly protecting him and preparing him for the special purpose of being Israel's deliver from captivity. So let's dive in. Chapter 2 of Exodus. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket, covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens walking alongside the Nile, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the boy was crying. She had pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go, go ahead. So the girl went, called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses and said, Because I drew him out of the water. Verse 11. 
Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. He went out the next day, and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, Why are you striking your companion? But he said, Who made you a prince or judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed that Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, Surely this matter has become known. When Pharaoh heard this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them water their flock. When they came to Ruel, their father, he said, why have you come back so soon today? So they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And what is more, he even drew the water for us and watered our flock. He said to his daughters, where is he then? Why is it that you have left this man behind? Invite him to have something to eat with us. Moses was willing to dwell with the man, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. Then she gave birth to a son, and he named him Gershom. For he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died. And the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. May God add his blessing to his word. If if you're new here, on the back of your apple today, there's a sermon outline. Feel free to use it if it helps you follow along. The title of this morning's message is The Delivered Deliverer. And the big idea is God is sending a deliverer to set his people free. Let's say it together. God is sending a deliverer to set his people free. So our chapter picks up in verse 1 with the word now. Now from the house of Levi went and took a wife of a Levite woman. So here, with the word now, Moses takes us back to how chapter 1 ended. And how did chapter 1 end? Look at verse 22. Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. This was the rising tension that last Sunday we kind of left there to be continued, where we know this Pharaoh is trying to stop the promises of God. He's trying to stop Israel from multiplying. He's trying to stop them from becoming a great nation. He's going against God, and here's the good news. No one goes against God and wins. And the more he stepped it up, the more they multiplied, to the point where last week ended, where it's not just the midwives trying to kill the little Hebrew boys, but now it's Everyone, all his people, if you see a Hebrew boy being birthed, you should put him to death. So Moses takes us back there, and then how does our narrative begin? He shares the love story of his parents. A man from the house of Levi married the daughter of someone in Levi. It's a typical love story. Man meets woman, they get married, they have kids. But what's interesting, Moses is talking about his parents, but he leaves their names out. We'll see in uh, chapter 6 of Exodus where his parents are finally named, Amram and Jochebed. They fall in love. They get married. They have three children. Miriam is the oldest, the daughter. Aaron is the middle. And then lastly, Moses, in our text, is born. Look at verse 2. When Moses is born, he's described as beautiful. Everyone underline that word. It's the same word used in Genesis 1. When God created the world, it was good. It was beautiful. So here we know that Moses is born and he's beautiful. And there's a lot more going on to this story than just a mom looking at their child thinking that they are beautiful. Most moms would have that affection. But there's more to the story. In Acts chapter 7, verse 20, it was at this time that Moses was born And he was lovely in the sight of God. And he was nurtured three months in his father's home. 
So what does it mean to be lovely in the sight of God? This was a special child. Something special was happening in chapter 2 of Exodus. That God is bringing his deliverer into the world. That's going to lead God's people out of slavery into the promised land. Just like he promised. So in verse 2, it's like this baby's born, and he's beautiful, and it's great. But what's the rising tension? That this boy has been marked with death. If anyone finds out about this child, he should be killed. Well, what's going to happen? Is he going to die? Is he going to live? Moses takes us there. And what does the text say? His parents are hiding him by faith. Remember last week, the midwives, they had faith in God. They feared God more than they feared the government or their authority or the Pharaoh. And they had faith and they protected the children. Same thing's going on here, but now it's not the midwives. It's the parents and they fear God and they're hiding him. And God honors that. In Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, Verse 23, listen to this. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. So instead of fearing their own lives, fearing the king, they're fearing God and they're walking by faith and they're trying to protect this child. Now, just pause for a moment. Think of how hard it would have been to protect a little baby. What do babies do? Cry, cry a lot. And just think about people walking around, Egyptians trying to listen for the cries. And I mean, just think of the energy and effort it had to do to protect and save this baby for three months. And look at verse three. Jochebed, the mom, could hide him no longer. So what did she do? She makes a papyrus basket. You could picture her making this basket with tar and pitch and is protected from the waters. I mean, she has faith. She's about to surrender her child. She's protected him. She could take it no longer. So now, just through the God's leading, she's going to put the child in a basket. She probably put it together where water is not going to get in. There's air holes so that he could breathe. And picture the mom putting her into the Nile, pushing him out, not knowing what. God is going to do. I mean, just put yourself in her shoes. What's interesting is that the only other time this word is used for papyrus basket is used earlier in Genesis 6, describing Noah's ark. Think about that. The same word to describe the ark is here to describe the basket. And every Hebrew would have understood, I hope we understand, sitting here at the end of progressive revelation that we see just like God's hand of grace was on this boat and was on Noah to protect him from the, the judgment of the waters that right here God's hand of grace was on this child's. God was going to not only protect him from the waters, but also of the king. I mean, what irony, too. The same river that was declared the river of death, where God knows how many Hebrew boys were thrown into that river. Now God chose to redeem it, and now it's going to be the river of life. Tell me who's greater. God is greater. Look at verse 4. Miriam, Moses' sister, is standing at, a, at the place, and she's glancing. What's going to happen? How is God going to step into this situation? And at the time Moses is in the water, the daughter of Pharaoh comes to bathe in the Nile. Now, you could picture just God's providence. We have a God that's in control of all things. Even as we sit here, he's controlling all things for his good in Christ to come. So as the child gets pushed out into the Nile, here comes the daughter of Pharaoh to bathe in the Nile. No such thing as coincidences. People would bathe in the Nile. Why? Because it was sacred. It was an a act of worship, ritualistic cleansing. So it's God's providence. She gets in the Nile. She sees this basket, and she asks her servant to go grab the basket. And as she opened it, you could picture God's perfect timing. She opens this basket, and what does the baby do? Cry. Causing her heart to be filled with pity. J. Vernon McGree says this. 
says something wonderful. He says, God brings two things together that he made. A baby's cry in a woman's heart. That's all it took. A mother's heart and a baby's cry. She had compassion on this child, unlike her father, her evil father. And look at verse 7. Miriam finally speaks. Should I go get someone to take care of this child? And Pharaoh's daughter says, yes. So Miriam, picture Miriam going back to her mom saying, Mom, Pharaoh's daughter wants you to come take care of this child. I mean, how crazy is this? She gets her child back from the water. She doesn't have to hide him. She gets royal protection for him. And she gets paid to be her, his, his mother. Like, do we have an awesome God or what? <laughs> Sermon's done. Let's go, man. We're done. I mean, this is unbelievable, the providence of God. And it's amazing how he always rewards faith. It's probably not how we think it's going to be. But friends, trust God because his providence is incredible. And she gets to take care of him. <laughs> she starts raising him, teaching him that he's a Hebrew, teaching him about all his Jewish heritage freely, not having to watch her back. Look at verse 10. Moses grows up and eventually she has to let go of her son again. To let go of her son, to trust that God has a plan for his life, that he's going to protect him. So she gave him back to Pharaoh's daughter. And what does Pharaoh's daughter do? Names him Moses. Names mean a lot all throughout scripture. We're going to see it time and time again, even in Exodus. What does Moses' name mean? It means to draw out. Not only was Moses drawn out of the Nile, but Moses is going to draw Israel out of slavery in the grips of Pharaoh's hands. Look at verse 11. Now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. Moses is now grown up in, in verse 11. So 40 years have transpired between Exodus 10 and 11. And how did Moses grow up? I mean, he had a privileged life. He was part of the royal family. All the benefits, all the blessings, all the prosperity. Acts chapter 7 says this. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians. And he was a man of power in words and deeds. The ancient Jewish historian Josephus wrote that Moses most likely was the heir to the throne. That Pharaoh had no other sons. That Moses was going to be the one. He had the best education you can have at that time. Josephus argues that Moses was a mighty warrior that led many battles, including Ethiopian. So you, you have this good-looking guy who's powerful, successful, educated, and then something happened in his heart. You know what happened? God happened. Because he begins to reject all the power, the position, the prosperity of his Egyptian identity. The text says he starts to identify with his Hebrew heritage and his people. Instead of the prospering, he's identifying with the slaves. Hebrews 11, listen to this. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt that he was looking for the reward. Friends, this is supernatural. Moses' example for us, he, he gave up the, the power and the prosperity. Why? Because God, looking to Christ, was his treasure. And the same is true for us when we accept Christ. We give up all of that to follow him and to live for him. And now we are sojourners in this family foreign lands until he brings us home. And our text says that he goes out and he looks upon the hard labors of his people, Mary. Think about this. And he looks and he sees an Egyptian beating one of his brethren. And this word for beating is not just striking. It could be used for slaughtering someone to death. Preston, beating someone to death. So here, Moses sees this happening. His heart is filled with justice, sympathy, brotherhood. So what does he do? Look at verse 12. He looks this way, and he looks that way. 
And he sees that no one's around, so what did he do? He killed the Egyptian. This is crazy. Premeditated murder. He's looking around. No one's looking at me. No one's looking at me. Egyptian's done. He took justice into his own hands. And he hid the Egyptian in the sand. Even though he looked to the left, even though he looked to the right, and no one was looking, he forgot there was another direction to look. And what direction was that? Upward. God was watching. The problem was he took things into his own hands. It wasn't God's way. It wasn't God's timing. He wanted to be a deliverer in his own strength and his own power, not relying on the Lord. He was more concerned about not being caught by men than of how God viewed him. He behaved like an Egyptian slave master. He kills the man and hides him. Look at 13. The next day, he goes out again, and two Hebrews now, they're fighting with each other. And there, Moses gets involved in their business and says, what are you doing? Stop. And look at verse 14. They said, who made you prince and judge over us? Who are you? Are you intending to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? And Moses was afraid because the word got out. Someone saw it. And he knew eventually that the word wasn't just going to get out to the people. It was going to get out to who? To Pharaoh. And that's exactly what happened. Pharaoh hears about a traitor, not only in his camp, in his own family. And Pharaoh goes after him to try to kill him. And what happens? Look at verse 15. Moses flees and goes into the desert. There's rising tension again. So now Moses leaves this life of prosperity and protection, and now he flees for his life, and he goes out into the desert, the wilderness, to the land of Midian. The Midianites were descendants of Abraham. So now Moses is in the desert, and he sits by a well, and he witnesses something. The priests of Midian had seven daughters and they're coming to this well to get water so they could take care of their flock and take care of their family. And the shepherds are trying to push them away. So here's Moses again, gets involved in another situation, but what does he do? He rescues them without violence. Somehow he flees off the shepherds and not only does he allow the daughters to get water, he helps them. So then the daughters go home to their dad, Ruel, which means friend of God. And you picture the daughters going home, and the dad's like, what are you doing home so early? It's kind of too soon. And the daughters, you can picture them saying, hey, dad, there was this situation. Like the shepherds weren't letting us get it, but there's this Egyptian that came out of nowhere. Maybe he was an angel. He's something and helped us. And the dad says, well, where is this man? Come and have him eat with us. So Moses gets the invitation and comes and eats with us. And for his courage, he's rewarded with bread and a wife. How awesome is that? <laughs> it's a pretty good reward for some courage. So he gets married and he has a son, Gershom. Gershom means I've been a foreigner in a foreign land. And yet God has taken care of him. Everything is going great. Moses has his wife, white picket fence, kids. Everything's great. He's shepherding the flock. The story could end there, but it doesn't. Look at verse 23. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died. The sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. Everyone highlight that, underline, rose up to God. First time it's put in there. God's hearing their prayers. So now we have this rising tension. Moses is being happy, shepherding the flock, but the king is now dead, and the Hebrews are crying out to God. And underline this four times. God heard, God remembered his covenant, God saw, and God took notice. Repetition four times. So chapter two ends with the author saying, God is about to move to be continued. Come back next week.
There's so much in these narratives to unpack, so much that God is speaking to his church back then to today about who he is and his will for our lives. There's two points I wanna focus on with our time together this morning. And there are two points regarding who God is and what he's doing. And I pray that we would be reminded of that this morning, both of these points. Number one, if you're filling in the blank, God is sovereignly protecting his deliverer. This just is jumping off the page. Our narrative is full of ups and downs where Moses' life is constantly at risk. It's like when God delivers him, then his life is at risk again. God delivers him again and again and again where God is the hero of the story. And as God's people walk by faith and do things, God is right there sovereignly protecting his deliverer, protecting his deliverer. What do you mean? Think about it. For three months when he was a baby, God protected him. When he was on the Nile in a boat, God protected him. For 40 years in Pharaoh's courts, God protected him. When Pharaoh found out he was a murderer, God protected him. And when he went into the desert trusting God, God did what, church? God protected him. God is the one in control, and his protection is something that's valuable. All throughout scripture, we know God protects his children and his people, but he doesn't always promise or guarantee that we wouldn't ever know pain or loss. I mean, that's not promised to us, but what is promised is we have a God that loves us and protects us, and we see that theme all throughout scripture. Even when God identified himself to the nation of Israel, there was corporate protection where God promised to protect Israel. In Deuteronomy 7, I want everyone to write that down. Write Deuteronomy 7 down. This is God promising corporate protection to Israel if they keep the law. But his protection doesn't stop with just the corporate people of God. God promises to protect individuals. We see David and Noah and Daniel. And in the New Testament, it reaches a a, a greater depth of spiritual protection in Christ. Where if you trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, of you and me. And now we have spiritual armor. And we have the word to guard our hearts. And God speaks this over his people. That nothing can separate you from the love of God once you're in the family. Friends, that is eternal protection. Amen? And nothing is greater than him. And not only that, he protects us in this world. Second Timothy, Paul writes in chapter four, he says this, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I love this. What is greater in this world? What does this world have to offer that's greater than the God of the universe protecting us? And here's the most amazing thing. It could, it's available for all of us. You want divine protection. The Bible says either you're his enemy or you can come in his family, just like Moses came into Pharaoh's family, and you can experience that protection. Well, Pastor, how do you do that? You come to that point in your life where you see Christ as the Savior, the true mediator, that his blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins. And if you trust in that finished work and call him Lord, you could be in his family and experience the sovereign protection physically and spiritually from the God of this world. It's coming to that point where you realize that Moses is great and Moses is gonna deliver Israel from physical bondage. But there is a greater Moses and his name is Jesus And he's going to come and he's going to offer deliverance from spiritual bondage, from sin and death. And as we read Exodus, I mean, this is the typology in Moses, that he is a type of Christ, that Moses was this mediator figure pointing to Christ. What do you mean, Pastor Derek? Think about it. Like Moses, Jesus was rescued from an evil ruler at birth. Like Moses, Jesus sojourned in Egypt. Like Moses, there were silent years before his public ministry. Like Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness, Jesus spent 40 days in the desert. Like Moses was rejected by his people at first, so was Jesus. 
And we're gonna see, just like God used Moses to deliver his people, the same deliverance is available for you and I today. What do you have to do? Come to faith in Christ and call him Lord. So we see God sovereignly protects not only his deliverers, his people, the last point this morning, which hopefully will encourage your heart. God was sovereignly preparing his deliverer. Think about our narrative. When Moses was 40, he thought he knew how to deliver his people. He relied on himself. He did it with violence. He was an immature leader. He did it in his own power, in his own way. And what did God have to do? God had to let him fall and send him into the desert. Why? To prepare him. To prepare him for what? To prepare him to be the deliverer that God wanted him to be. And what kind of deliverer was that? A shepherd leader. God brought him into the wilderness for 40 years to teach him and make him into the leader that God desired him to be. Now think about this. Think about when Moses was going into the desert, fleeing for his life, probably thought that he messed up so badly where he just didn't have any hope anymore for God to use him in any other way. Some of you have been there. Maybe you made a mistake. God led you into a desert as a consequence of your mistake, and you probably felt the same way, that there is no way God can use me again, that I'm just gonna wander in the wilderness for all my years, and here's what God is saying. No, no, no. God is not done with you, and in a way I can't explain. He uses all our successes and all our failures to what? To mold us into the image of the leader and the son and daughter that he wants to be. How amazing is that? That's how big our God is. So here you can picture Moses out in the the fields with the sheep, working hard, becoming less. And when he is ready, God's going to send him back. But he's not going to lead with a physical sword, a spiritual one. He's going to let God go before him with a rod to change Pharaoh's hearts. I just want to encourage you this morning. In Moses' life, in our lives, no matter the successes or failures, God's not done with you, Carson. He's making you into the man he wants you to be. He's in, he's there, and I promise you, just like Moses was right where he needed to be, we are all here today, right where God has us, and God is at work behind the scenes. And what does he want for us to become less, to trust him more, to obey his ways and stop taking things into our own hands as he prepares us for works that he has advanced for us to do. We see this preparation all throughout scripture. Joshua and Caleb, they went into the land. Remember, they had to spy it out and they had to come back and they were the only two who walked by faith. God was preparing them to then eventually Take the promised land. You think of Joseph. Think about all those nights where he's pounding on the walls of the prison saying, God, what are you doing? And God is saying, Joseph, you have no idea. I'm preparing you and making you love me and trust me for the day that you're going to rescue my people and I'm going to rise you up to protect them against the famine. Think of Paul. The road to Damascus, there was a time of preparation where God led him in the desert for three years to teach him who God was so he could represent God. Think about the disciples for three years. They're being covered with the dust of Jesus' sandals. Why? Because God was preparing them to birth the church and set this world on fire. Here's the good news. Whatever you're going through, wherever you're at at right now, God is working behind the scenes, amen? So often, it's so easy to ask why. When you're in these desert seasons, why God, why God? That's my first inclination. When life gets harder, I mess up. Why, why, why? But instead, maybe a better question is what? What, Lord, are you doing to prepare me 
for what you have ahead for me. Well, Pastor Eric, I don't know. God promises this in Ephesians 2, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would do what? Walk in them. We've seen this morning God protecting and preparing his deliverer. Please come back next week as we continue the story. And while we're going to see, while Pharaoh was planning Israel's extermination, God was planning Israel's emancipation. Amen?